Great Wall of China became the unofficial symbol of the Chinese nation in 1972, when then-President Richard Nixon walked upon it during his tour marking U.S. diplomatic recognition of China. I think that you would have to conclude that this is a great wall and that it had to be built by a great people. But the Chinese themselves have not always taken such pride in the Great Wall. The traditional Chinese view of the wall was that it was a symbol of oppressive government and military weakness and futility. It was a symbol of the suffering of ordinary Chinese people under despotic rule. It rises where the mountains meet the sea at Shanghai Quan and snakes its way across northern China to the edge of the Gobi Desert, forming the spine of a system of so-called long walls that sprawl over thousands of miles of the Chinese landscape. Estimates of its length range between 1,500 and 4,000 miles, and its grandeur has been widely celebrated in myth and legend. Yet the existence of the Great Wall remained unknown to the Western world for more than 1,500 years. Incredibly, it was never depicted in classical Chinese paintings of the period, nor did Marco Polo mention it in writing about his travels in China in the 13th century. In fact, the Chinese did not even refer to a Great Wall of China until the 20th century, after the captivated West gave it a name. The beginning of the 20th century, uh, you begin to have the Western idea which glorifies the wall as the sort of symbol of China. And all of those uh, Western myths are embraced by the Chinese to become part of a new cultural myth for China. In 1908, author and adventurer William Edgar Giel became the first American to travel the length of the Great Wall. His observations were more enthusiastic than illuminating, and some of his infamous pronouncements have been repeated well into the modern age. The Great Wall is a symbol of China's golden age. It is 1,700 miles long and the only man-made structure on Earth visible by eye from the moon. The Great Wall of China cannot be seen from the moon. This myth was widespread at the time of the astronauts' flights, and it's well known in the community of astronauts, of people who've actually been in space, that you cannot see the Great Wall from outer space. But astronauts will tell you that nearly every time they go to speak, someone will ask uh, the question. Man recently glimpsed the Great Wall from space with highly enhanced thermographic photographs taken by satellite. But other durable myths persist, unlikely to be validated by science. There were all kinds of calculations in the early 19th century about how you could take all of the stone in the wall and redeploy it around the equator and build walls there, or it would be equivalent to all the houses in uh, England and Scotland. And these are still repeated into the 20th century. The biggest myth about the Great Wall of China is that there is a Great Wall of China. It is doubtful that the Great Wall ever existed at all as a continuous, homogenous barrier across northern China. Rather, it is a discontinuous series of walls built at different times by different people, for different reasons, joined together, allowed to decay, rebuilt, and extended over a period of some 2,000 years. Well, I think when people think of the Great Wall, they tend to think of this long, sort of monumental, continuous structure that stretches thousands of miles across the frontier of China. The reality, of course, is quite different, that the wall was built in pieces. Much of it is nothing more than sort of an archaeological midden of fallen down ramparts. And in desert sections of China, much of it's even been buried. So the reality of the wall is not exactly <laughs> as you see it when you visit. Badaling, for instance, outside of Beijing, where it's been perfectly restored. Well, what we're referring to when we talk about the Great Wall today is usually what remains of the walls that were built by the Ming Dynasty. The ones that they built in the 16th century are quite remarkable. Uh, they're solid masonry climbing up a precipitous mountainsides with uh, watchtowers, and it's really very difficult to imagine how they were built and how they were completed. 
For all its massive size and solid dimensions, the Great Wall of China remains a mysterious presence. It has never been completely surveyed, and even today no one can be sure of its exact length or route. The history of the Great Wall that has come down to us is a curious mixture of reality and imagination, a little solid information interwoven with vast amounts of myth and tradition, and it is virtually impossible to separate the two. No other civilization seems to have adopted wall building as enthusiastically as the Chinese. The first settlements of Neolithic times were surrounded by barriers of pounded earth. The cornerstone of society was the walled city. Indeed, the Chinese word for city, Chang, also means wall. China is walls within walls within walls. The Great Wall was the mother of all walls, within which these other concentric circles of walls, right down to the wall around one's private house, which everybody had. Walls are very sort of deeply organic part of, of Chinese history and culture. They surrounded their houses and temples with walls and projected their wall consciousness beyond the realm of the mortal world into the kingdom of the gods. The god of walls and moats also had the power over the boundaries between life and death, being appointed to inform the dying of their fates. The Chinese build walls to define their spaces, to keep strangers at a distance and members of the clan within. Some walls may have had ritual significance as well, but ancient China was a hostile realm, and most of the serious walls were probably built for defensive purposes, with nomads raiding from the north and neighboring territories ever alert for signs of weakness. A wall was considered a strategic military necessity. By the end of the 8th century BC, the land that would become China had entered a period of interstate strife that would last for 500 years. It consisted of dozens of feudal states and tiny fiefdoms ruled by warlords, bound loosely to a ruling dynasty whose power was more spiritual and ritualistic than actual. By the middle of the fourth century BC, chivalry and allegiance to the king had given way to self-interest and butchery. It was during this warring states period that the Chinese began building defensive walls in earnest. The state of Qi built a wall along its southern border to keep out the armies of Chu. Chu built a northern barrier to protect themselves against Qin. Yan and Chao built walls to keep out northern barbarians and each other. In all, some 2,800 miles of walls were built along the frontiers of the various fighting states. At some time, there were about 120 different states. By the time you get to the height of the Warring States period, there are only seven states left. There has been tremendous destruction of the small independent states throughout China. Out of the bloodshed and destruction of the Warring States period, the major philosophies of China began to evolve, as learned men tried to figure out what had gone wrong and how to make it right. In the 5th century BC, Confucius stressed the need for strict observation of the rules and conduct of relationships between man and heaven and deplored the necessity for wars and walls. Another group of thinkers, the Taoists, sought answers in nature and believed everything to be in a constant state of flux between the forces of yin and yang. Therefore, struggle and war were pointless. Had either of these major philosophies become the state philosophy, it is unlikely that the Great Wall would ever have been built. But the state of Qin adopted legalism, a harsh totalitarian system of rules, punishments, and just rewards. There's a very nice story about the crown keeper and the coat keeper. The king falls asleep one night in front of the fire, and the crown keeper comes in and sees his majesty is cold, so he puts the cloak on top of the king. The king wakes up and says, who put the coat on me? And the crown keeper says, I did. And the king immediately executes the crown keeper because that was not his job. These principles guided the Qin armies in the third century BC, when according to a Han dynasty historian, they began moving across the map of China, absorbing the other states as a silkworm devours a mulberry leaf. 
In 246 BC, a pivotal event of enormous significance occurred. A 13-year-old boy ascended to the throne of Qin. He was to become known as Qin Shu Wangdi, the first sovereign emperor of China. Legend says he flew to the moon on a magic carpet in a dream. Looking down, he saw his kingdom was vulnerable to his enemies, who were many, and at the mercy of invaders from all sides. He roused his advisors from sleep and announced, I will build a great wall. The original Chinese symbol for the word country depicted a walled enclosure. By 500 BC, the symbol had evolved to include a soldier within the enclosure. Modern marvels will return. We now return to the Great Wall of China on Modern Marvels. In 1974, farmers digging a well uncovered an astonishing archaeological find. A cache of terracotta soldiers, bowmen, chariots and horses, all life-size and each one different, as if modeled from life. To date, more than 6,000 figures have been excavated. An entire terracotta army designed to fight the battles of a great king in the next life, or perhaps guard his eternal rest in his realm. Nearby lay the tomb of China's first emperor, Qin Shu Huangdi, known as the only first. According to accounts handed down by later dynasties, Qin Shu Huangdi's claim to the throne of Qin was of dubious origin. His mother was an enthralling young dancer and concubine to a prosperous traveling merchant who was as cunning as he was wealthy. While trading at a royal court, the merchant asked her to dance for the young Qin heir. When the princely heir fell in love with her, the merchant gave the concubine to him never mentioning that she was already pregnant with his own child. The prince died after a short reign, and Qin Shu Wangdi ascended to the throne while still a child. As the boy king matured, he began to show signs of eccentric behavior and paranoia. He banished his mother and ordered his father, the former merchant who had ruled during his boyhood, to commit suicide. He surrounded himself with soothsayers, sorcerers, and necromancers, and shrewd, unscrupulous advisors. Around 234 BC, he sent his army out to complete the conquest of China, his Qin predecessors had begun. By the Warring States period, you have independent states slugging it out. And finally, only five are left, only four are left, only three are left, and then only one is left. And in 221 BC, China is unified. When the state of Qin destroys the state of Qi. The king declared himself first sovereign emperor of a new land he named China after his dynasty and moved quickly to consolidate his power. Qin Shi Huangdi really did create an empire where there had not been one before. He, he built a national road or highway system. He standardized the Chinese script. He unified Chinese currency. He standardized the empire. He made it one, one big single entity. And coupled with that was this incredible interest in magic and alchemy, and the belief that somehow he could defy all uh, mortal bounds and live forever. He was a megalomaniac. Qin Shu Wangdi standardized the kingdom's weights and measurements with a system based on the number six, his magic number. He declared black his mystical color, the official color of all clothing, flags, and pendants of the realm, and elevated his title to that of the only first, thus decreeing that the Qin dynasty would rule forever. Then he decided to build a great wall. No one knows exactly when the notion of building a great wall came into the emperor's mind or why he decided to build it. One legend has it that one of his soothsayers predicted his dynasty would fall at the hands of a northern barbarian tribe. Others relate to dreams, omens, and the emperor's inclination to build prodigious monuments to his own glory whenever possible. We do know that around the time he unified China, Xin Shu Wangdi plays General Meng Tian, an energetic and successful military officer, in charge of building a great wall that would separate the civilized people and fertile land.
lands of China, from the barbarians and demons said to inhabit the barren steppes to the north. The wall was to stretch from the Yellow Sea in the east to the Gobi Desert in the west. It was to be 24 feet high in places and wide enough for eight men to march abreast along its top. The wall was to follow natural features of the land whenever possible and never to flow in a straight line because demons were believed to travel only in straight lines and were therefore unable to cross crooked lines or turn corners. The construction of the wall varied greatly in technique from place to place and very little remains of Qin Shu Wang Di's wall to tell us how it was done, though many scholars believe it served as a pattern for future walls built on its foundation. Meng Tian probably began with the towers. Made of brick or stone with a stone or rubble base, they were generally about 40 feet high and 40 feet square at the base, tapering to 30 feet square at the summit. Once the towers were complete, they were joined by a stone curtain, a demon barrier, to keep out invaders and evil spirits. Garrison towers large enough to hold hundreds of troops were stationed the length of two arrow shots apart, so that all of the territory in between was covered. The towers protruded from the wall like turrets so defenders could fire at attackers along the wall's base. It is estimated that the Qin under General Meng constructed several hundred miles of new wall. The rest of the barrier was made up of already existing walls, which were joined and incorporated into its body. And essentially what he was doing was linking a series of earlier walls which the warring states had already built against the nomads in the north. I would say they absolutely followed the rammed earth technique. It's the only technique they knew. They may have done it bigger, or taller, wider, but it's, it's no different in construction techniques from the Neolithic walls. In the eastern mountains, dry earth was pounded between two wall faces of brick or stone until it was of a sufficient level and solid. Then a layer of brick or stone was laid on top to seal it against rain and make a roadway. Further west, where the land is made of a fine silt called yellow earth or loess, laborers poured the soil mixed with water into wooden frames and rammed it into a solid structure as it dried. On the arid western plain, the wall was built from layers of palm fronds, reeds and gravel held together with mud ending at the edges of the great desert, beyond which lay the demon-haunted wilderness known to the Chinese as Ku Wai, outside the passes. General Meng built the first Great Wall in less than 10 years, completing it sometime before 210 BC. But already stories had begun to circulate calculating its cost in terms of human suffering and human lives. The massive manpower necessary to build the Great Wall was recruited by forced conscription from the peasantry, supplemented with criminals, captured soldiers, defeated nobles, scholars, and other so-called enemies of the sovereign. It has been said that every third man in the empire was pressed into service, and of every ten recruited, only three returned home. Legend tells that the emperor ordered that any man found taking a nap on the wall should be buried alive in it. The popular memory of wall building is of peasants being rounded up, being sent off to work, uh, never coming back, uh, dying in some remote wilderness, uh, uh, slaving away. It's an absolutely horrible uh, story, and the legend is that the bodies of workers who died were simply tossed into the, the middle part of the wall, uh, between the uh, masonry where you just had rubble. Uh, and this outrage or this popular feeling expressed itself in a variety of poems, but perhaps most famously in this legend of Lady Meng. One of the great stories that kids studied uh, in school uh, in the early first 20 years of communist rule was with a parable of this woman going to find her husband who Qin Shi Huang had sent to the wall to work as a form of slave labor and he, she finds that he's dead and probably buried in the wall as many people were. So in that sense, the wall was, was viewed as an artifact of feudal oppression built by the sweat of 
ordinary people under the whiplash of this tyrant. Now, we find it's exactly the opposite. And the Great Wall has been transformed into this symbol of China's greatness, the longevity of its civilization, um, and representing a country of, of great power, history, and consequence. When construction fell behind schedule, one of his seers told the emperor the wall would never be completed unless 10,000 men were buried alive in it. Feeling he couldn't spare 10,000 workers, Qin Shi Huang Di solved the problem by finding one man whose name included the Chinese character for 10,000 and entombed him in the wall instead. It is estimated that more than a million men worked on the wall during its years of construction under deplorable conditions and there can be no doubt that thousands of them died of exposure, exhaustion and starvation. Even today stories persist that their bodies were buried where they fell, interred forever inside the longest cemetery on earth. Less than a decade had passed since the unification of China. Other vast changes had occurred. Great public works projects, canals, roads, and agricultural programs had been successfully completed. Now, with the Great Wall in place, Qin Shi Huang Di boasted that his empire was invincible. But the Chinese have a saying, when things have reached their peak, they decline. We now return to the Great Wall of China on Modern Marvels. Even as the Great Wall was under construction, Qin Shi Huang Di descended further into mysticism and madness. In 213 BC, he decided that history should begin with him and ordered that all copies of books of history and classical literature be burned. Any person found to be in possession of such books 30 days after the decree was to be shipped off to do forced labor on the Great Wall or be buried alive an estimated 460 scholars perished. When the emperor's eldest son and heir disagreed with the policy, he too was exiled to the north to assist General Meng. As he grew older, the emperor's obsession with his own death intensified. Although he made only one recorded visit to survey the construction of his great wall, he reportedly made as many as five extensive journeys in search of an elixir of immortality. On one such journey in 210 BC, he died at the age of 49, his death possibly hastened by noxious potions containing mercury, arsenic, and sulfur, which he had consumed in his quest for eternal life. There isn't a great deal about him that you would find to like in the records that have come down to us. He burnt the books, he's supposed to have buried Confucians alive, and so on. It's very hard to find much that would be admirable, but he was a very powerful ruler. And like most rulers in ancient China, he wished to be buried as a king should be buried. And he started work on his tomb some 30 or 40 years before he died. Even before he united China, he had started work on this massive mausoleum. Excavation continues on the pits of terracotta soldiers, but Qin Shi Huang Di's burial mound is yet to be opened. It is said to be booby-trapped and is believed to contain treasures more magnificent than those recovered from any other tomb as well as the bodies of the emperor's wives and the architects who planned its design so they could never give away its secrets. The um, first emperor was told by a soothsayer that he was going to be overthrown by Hu, by H-U. And he took this to mean the Hu, which is the Chinese word for the horse nomads, for the barbarians. But his dynasty perished at the hands of his second son, Hu Hai. With the rightful heir still in exile, Hu Hai ascended to the throne of Qin with all of his father's viciousness and guile, but none of his strength and leadership abilities. He imprisoned all his father's advisors, including General Meng Tian, who, after reflection on his misfortunes, took his own life, saying that he deserved to die because he had violated the qi, or energy flow of the earth, by cutting through mountains, rivers, and other natural features when he built the Great Wall. Hu Hai ruled only four years before rebel forces deposed him and China was thrown into civil war. The great dynasty that was to last forever had lasted only 15 years, the shortest reign of any dynasty ever to rule China. 
For all its imposing size and strength, the Great Wall wasn't very effective in stemming the tide of invasions from northern nomads. Known collectively as Tartars, after a medieval name for hell, the Chinese said they were more monsters than men, devouring the flesh of dogs and horses and drinking the blood of their enemies, strong of body, ruthless of heart, and in war, invincible. One of them who was preparing an assault on the Great Wall was a fierce Mongolian leader whose name would become synonymous with terror throughout the empire and the world, Genghis Khan. If the Great Wall were transplanted to the United States, it would run a zigzag course from Philadelphia to Topeka, Kansas. The Great Wall of China will continue in a moment on Modern Marvels. We now return to the Great Wall of China on Modern Marvels. For more than a thousand years after the death of the first emperor, subsequent dynasties worked on the wall or allowed it to decay according to the military needs and political climate of the times. Some, like the Han Dynasty, kept parts of the wall in repair, added to it, or built their own walls. Others, like the Tang Dynasty, who believed it useless as a defensive barrier and too expensive to maintain, allowed it to fall into ruin. The barbarian onslaughts continued with most of the successful invaders gradually assimilating into the culture, often becoming more Chinese than the Chinese. Well, the popular conception of the Great Wall is that it was an enclosure that would keep the barbarians out and protect China from invasion. Uh, and that also made it difficult for Chinese to move into areas beyond the Great Wall. It was seen as the boundary between civilization and non-civilization. And the truth of the matter is, the wall was very porous, very easily uh, crossed. The idea that you can seal off the frontier is not, uh, not going to work. The nomads will always find a way, they'll find a break in the wall. They will often simply be let in by people who are guarding the wall. And even in the Ming, at the heyday of wall building, they regularly either went around the end of fortifications, or came through gates, and they turned up uh, right outside the city walls of Peking. Legend says Genghis Khan was born clutching a clot of blood in his right fist as a symbol of his bloody future. As a young man, he conquered and united warring Mongol factions and forged a mighty army. And in 1211 AD, the Mongol horde of Genghis Khan swept down upon China like devils loosed out of hell, crossing the Great Wall and spreading across the land like grasshoppers covering the face of the earth. This force was able to create the largest empire in the world. I mean, they were, they were unbelievably fierce fighters. And they relied upon, in addition to their martial skills, a psychological terror. When they took the city of Herat, they killed everybody because they wanted to impress all of the people of Central Asia with the fact that if there was any resistance, the opponents would be killed. The greatest joy a man can have is victory to conquer one's enemies, to pursue them, to deprive them of their possessions, to reduce their families to tears, to ride on their horses and to make love to their wives and daughters. Genghis Khan. It took 60 bloody years before the whole of China fell to the Mongols under the leadership of Genghis Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan. He declared himself Emperor of China in 1271 the Mongols would rule China for nearly 100 years. China under Mongol rule became a cosmopolitan place because the Mongol Empire opened China to Eurasia and connected it to the trade routes that crossed the land all the way to the Middle East. It was during this time that Marco Polo is said to have gone to China and it has long been debated as to why he never mentioned the Great Wall in his writings. In fact, it is likely that the Great Wall of China as we know it did not exist during Marco Polo's days at the court of the Khan.
During the years of Mongol rule, what remained of the Qin Great Wall had fallen into ruin. The Chinese never accepted Mongol rule, and Kublai Khan was never regarded as anything but a barbarian by the Chinese, no matter how much he impressed Marco Polo and the other visitors. Frequent uprisings by Chinese rebels chipped away at the Mongol occupation until finally in 1368, a Chinese peasant led an army which drove the last of the Mongols out of China and founded the Ming Dynasty. The Ming are the most active wall builders in Chinese history. If the Ming had never done their work, there would be no idea of a great wall of China, and the fortifications built by other dynasties would be interesting footnotes in historical texts. Now, what we know today as the Great Wall is certainly the Ming Wall. That's what you see if you go to visit the Great Wall of China. And it's very different from any of its predecessors. It's made of masonry uh, in most places. It has crenellations. To build the Ming Walls, you had to have specialized groups of masons and stone cutters and whatnot. You had to pay them with money. It's an operation of an entirely different uh, scale and character compared to the earlier ones. Much of the Ming Wall is built on a foundation of granite blocks as long as 14 feet and three or four feet thick, all accurately cut and fitted. A facing of handmade bricks up to five feet thick was built up on top of these blocks up to 20 feet in height. The center cavity was filled with pounded earth and covered with the same brick, forming a 14 foot wide roadway across the top. The Ming created elaborate gates along points in the wall and crowned the eastern terminus at Shanghai Quan with the first gate under heaven. At the western terminus at Jai Yu Quan, they built the Jade Gate or Martial Barrier. The Ming left hundreds of memorials and tablets along the wall extolling the emperor's wisdom and virtues and providing interesting data about the work they had completed. One name that appears frequently is that of Wan Li, who reigned in the 16th century and made such a contribution to the Great Wall that many Chinese in later centuries thought he was the original builder. The Chinese name for the wall, Wan Li Chang Chang, meaning Wall of 10,000 Li, can also be translated as Wan Li's Wall. But as powerful as Wan Li's wall was, it couldn't keep the Mongols from making regular raids into Chinese territory or block the armies of a powerful tribe of hunters from Manchuria who cast covetous eyes on the rich lands to the south. The Ming obsession with the Great Wall became their psychological defense against the Mongols. It wasn't much of a military uh, defense in itself. It created a kind of Star Wars mentality that somehow they would be able to, to, at great expense and cost, find a way to hold off the Mongols who had been expelled from China but never, never brought under control. One of the striking things about the Great Wall is it's very expensive to maintain troops there, to supply troops. The estimate is if you send uh, 60 cartloads of uh, grain up to the Great Wall, you have to eat 59 of them to get that one cartload up there. This means that the Chinese tended to, to uh, establish military colonies at the wall itself, where the soldiers would be farmers too and would feed themselves. The Chinese who were sent to garrison the area are very unhappy about it, and they're sent there for life. They tend to settle down. So you find that there are plenty of Chinese up there who can speak nomadic languages, and they're on good terms with the Mongols. They trade, they make money. And it doesn't surprise me a bit that if some Mongols want to come through some gate that these people are supposed to be guarding, that, you know, in consideration of a small payment, then they will uh, look the other way. This system was one of the uh, foibles that led to the downfall of the Ming because they weren't very good farmers and the land up there wasn't very good. The system broke down and the military colonies themselves by the end of the Ming began to become barbarian themselves. 
The Manchurians took Peking in 1644 after the commanding officer at Nanku Pass and many of his troops deserted to join the Manchu. They would rule China into the beginning of the 20th century when the last Manchu emperor, a child named Pu Yi, was overthrown by a democratic rebellion in 1912. It was a great source of humiliation that, that China twice uh, was attacked and conquered by these barbarians from outside the wall, the Mongols and then the Manchus. And then interestingly enough, the name barbarian then got applied to Westerners who suddenly arrived in ships. And of course there was no wall in the ocean. There was an interim where the Great Wall was a forgotten piece of history in a way to, to Chinese. It had stopped being functional. The fox had gotten into the hen house. It was basically all over. The Manchu didn't need the Great Wall as a military or national boundary because they ruled the territory on both sides of it. It was designed to turn back barbarians. Yet now, the barbarians ruled China. The Great Wall of China would not play a significant role in Chinese history again for more than 300 years, until the 20th century, when it would be transformed from an emblem of China's guarded past into a powerful symbol for change. We now return to the Great Wall of China on Modern Marvels. By the late 19th and early 20th centuries, China had become a fashionable destination for the more adventurous Western tourists. And no trip was complete without an outing to the Great Wall. When the Westerners first came to China, they were terribly impressed, I think, with the high degree of civilization they saw. Uh, the cities were prosperous, lively, the population was immense. The uh, elites were very refined, educated, a wonderful literate tradition going back thousands of years. And I think there was a tendency to glorify many of the achievements of Chinese civilization. And this great wall just outside of Beijing was another one of these remarkable achievements. While Westerners flocked to admire the Great Wall that had captured their imaginations, the Chinese still viewed it as a reminder of feudal oppression and military failure. In desert regions where shelter is hard to come by and building materials scarce, peasants carted away great sections of the wall for use as building materials, and other families had built dwellings inside of the ruin itself. What's interesting to observe is that when Westerners come and start visiting, the Chinese are just not interested at all, they pay no attention to it, and the Westerners are thrilled and they get out and start measuring it, and sketching it, and drawing it, and half of this picture is still true today. That is, when Westerners get there, they still get all excited and start taking pictures. But today what's fascinating is the Chinese do the same thing. During the Japanese invasion of China during the 30s and 40s, Many of the war's great battles were fought along the Great Wall, and it began to be portrayed as a symbol of popular resistance, particularly among the communists. Mao Zedong himself, and many other leaders of the communist movement, celebrated the Great Wall in poetry and song. In fact, the song which is now the national anthem of the People's Republic of China was written by a communist poet in 1935. Arise ye who refuse to be slaves. With our very flesh and blood, let us build our new Great Wall. After the Communist Revolution in 1949, there was a brief renaissance for the Great Wall, and restoration work was begun along portions that had been badly damaged in the war. But the Communists' regard for the Great Wall of China was to be short-lived. Mao Zedong was an incredible paradox. He was really sort of deeply, uh, I think, riven between a being very organically connected to China's past and also having an ideology which, which required, in a sense, that he be opposed to it. So there was a great contradiction at work at the heart of Chairman Mao. And in a certain sense, the Great Wall lies at the heart of it. It was a symbol of China's unity and greatness. It was also a symbol of, the, of its autocracy, of its sort of wanton oppression of ordinary people. Uh, he never worked this out. During Chairman Mao's great cultural revolution, many of China's treasures of the past were destroyed. 
priceless bronze works of art were melted down for scrap. The magnificent wall surrounding the city of Beijing was torn down and a freeway built in its place. Thousands of ancient structures were demolished to make way for modern construction, and the Great Wall was no exception. Hundreds of miles of the Great Wall were destroyed, often with dynamite and heavy machinery, and the material used for road, reservoir, and building construction. But even as the Great Wall was being plundered, there was a quiet resurgence of respect for traditional Chinese culture and a deepening sense of national identity rooted in Chinese history. Richard Nixon's 1972 visit to the Great Wall marked a symbolic turning point. When China was an empire, protocol dictated that visiting foreign dignitaries go to the palace and pay their respects by bowing down in front of the emperor. Today, there's no longer an emperor. But when official visitors come to China, the traditional ceremony of paying homage to the greatness of the country and to the Chinese people is often carried out with a trip to the Great Wall. The Great Wall in today's China has become a symbol of China's greatness, of the patriotic love of the Chinese people for their homeland, and of China's strength and determination to be respected. When the People's Republic of China joined the United Nations, they presented the organization with this spectacular tapestry of the Great Wall, measuring 32 by 16 feet and weighing 600 pounds, thus declaring the Great Wall the official symbol of the Chinese nation. In 1984, the Chinese government embarked on an active campaign of wall restoration, launched by Premier Deng Xiaoping himself, declaring let us love our country and restore our Great Wall. Since then, more than 200 world leaders and 50 million tourists have visited the Great Wall of China. It is an extraordinarily powerful tourist destination. In many ways, I mean, the Great Wall has become a kind of a, you know, a Disneyland ride. You go there and you can sit on a camel and have your picture taken. You can dress up like Qin Shi Huang. Or you can buy, you know, tote bags. You can buy t-shirts. You know, I visited the Great Wall. Anywhere there's a little niche, somebody has got a product. The Great Wall's popularity has prompted the Chinese to expand their restoration efforts to sites outside the major tourist area near Beijing so that crowding and associated wear and tear will not endanger the physical survival of the ruins. Nobody goes to China without going to the Great Wall. It's pretty spectacular. You, you rise up onto this wall that doesn't just sort of stretch away like a, uh, some sort of modern day construction, but it follows the contours of the hills and the mountains and it, and it winds and it is very much like some sort of a serpent that, that's coiled out across this very wild and uninhabited landscape and you just sort of takes your breath away. Everybody knows the Great Wall. You don't need to have read a book. You don't need to have be very worldly. You think of China, what do you think of? The Great Wall. The story of the Great Wall of China is one of bloody conflict and human suffering, which emerges ultimately as a tribute to the spirit of a land and a people. And as China integrates itself into the world community and rejects the path of isolation, which the wall so long symbolized, the Great Wall has been transformed into a marvel of persistence and antiquity, imperial splendor, and national pride. Ever wonder how the West was truly won?